Welcome everyone to NSPA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Tonight's presentation is titled Modern Butterflies and Citizen Science. And our presenters are Jim O'Leary from the Maryland Science Center and Grant Bowers from the University of Minnesota. My name is Bryn Slate. I'll be moderating today. And we have Jeff Lehman online with us to provide technical support. Before we jump in, I wanted to remind everyone to visit the NSTA Learning Center, which is your online portal for over 10,600 resources for science educators. And when you log on to the Learning Center, you will find that over 3,700 of those resources are free and that you can add them to your library so you can get to those when it's a good time for you, anytime. We do have community forums that you can access to connect with other science teachers. And if you're um, looking for help finding specific resources and using the Learning Center, you can reach out to our online advisors. Our free PD tools are a great way to organize your professional learning and to reach your goals. And it is all available and more by going to learningcenter.nsta.org. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. As I mentioned, Jim O'Leary is from the Maryland Science Center. He's going to be getting us started. And Grant Bowers is from the Monarchs in the Classroom Lab at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Welcome, Jim. Hello, Bryn. Thank you for uh, all the work you've been doing. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us after your, uh, your day at school. Uh, we are the uh, at the Maryland Science Center here in Baltimore. We've been uh, working with a film production team in Canada called SK Films, and they've recently produced an IMAX film called Flight of the Butterflies, uh, which is available in both 3D and 2D. And we are the educational development team for that film. The film came out October 1st, 2012, and uh, Bryn has uh, our first poll up there. I'm kind of curious how many people have uh, have seen Flight of the Butterflies, either in 3D or 2D. So you can use your uh, poll tool to uh, let us know if you've seen it yet or not. And for we those who may have logged have on a little bit early uh, or a little bit later after our uh, introduction, I know we've got a few folks who just logged on. Your poll buttons are located right under your own name at the top of the participants window if you haven't found that yet. And Jim, it looks like we've got uh, a lot of people who still have a awesome experience ahead of them to see the film. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've done a number of educator workshops, and uh, the teachers have really, really enjoyed it. And our, our audiences love it as well. It's playing now in about 50-plus uh, IMAX and other large format theaters around the country, actually around the world. And I'll take you to the website in a bit so you can see where it's playing and where, where it might be coming uh, near you. The, the project received major funding from the National Science Foundation, which is uh, responsible for not only helping to fund the film, but all the education materials and supporting today's webcast as well. So a big thank you to the uh, to NSF, the National Science Foundation. And it's allowed us to work here at the Maryland Science Center with Monarchs in the Classroom at the University of Minnesota. Grant Bowers, our other presenter tonight, is uh, uh, with the uh, Monarch Lab and has been present in a number of our workshops, does a great job. If you've been, you, you understand. Each workshop um, has included a screening of the film. We've actually had the handling of live monarch specimens, which is a, a highlight of the, of the workshop, and demonstrations of activities for the, the classroom. Our NSTA workshops have been held in uh, Louisville and Phoenix last year in San Antonio just a few weeks ago. We hope to do more in the fall if funding holds out. That's yet to be determined. So Portland, Oregon, and Denver, Colorado in the fall are our potential other workshop sites. So if you're going to those uh, NSTA conferences, we hope to see you there. So I'm wondering another poll here. Has anybody attended the uh, symposium we recently did in uh, San Antonio? I think I recognize at least one name on our list from folks who attended there. Yeah, Barbara was uh, at our workshop. Hope she had a good time. We got many great reviews of uh, the workshops. The half day lasts from uh, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, packed with uh, lots of uh, lots of activities and information about the monarchs. Okay. Well, I hope if uh, you get a chance, you might be able to attend our future workshops uh, if we can uh, swing those in, in the fall of uh, 2013. So to be, to be determined. Uh, 
Okay, so we're going to uh, take a tour of the uh, the website, uh, Flight of the Butterflies. You can find it at flightofthebutterflies.com. I can take you there by posting the um, the URL, and we will uh, take a look at the Flight of the Butterflies website that has information about the film, where it's playing, but also educational materials, background information on uh, monarchs, their life cycle, their migration patterns. And I'll take you through a little bit of that before we turn it over to Grant for the, the bulk of the presentation. So wait a few seconds. I've got the uh, the home page in front of me now, Flight of the Butterflies in 3D with a monarch on a, on a tree, some reviews down at the bottom. I'll just wait a few seconds for everybody's browsers to catch up. And uh, what I can do when I when I go to the next uh, uh, pages on this website, uh, you'll automatically follow. But uh, you'll have to do the scrolling up and down of the website or the pages when we get to individual pages. So I'm going to click on the orange arrow, continue to website, which includes all the tabs that uh, you have the uh, ability to find your way through. And again, I'll wait a few seconds for all, everybody to catch up, me included. Okay, I just uh, I just got there myself. So once you do get there, you'll see uh, again Flight of the Butterflies in 3D. A number of tabs across the top. We'll explore in a few seconds. And at the center of the um, this page is the trailer for the film, which is about 90 seconds. I'm going to play that for you so you can get a, a sense of what the film is like. The, the screen, if, if you can see it now, is a blue field filled with uh, hundreds and hundreds of monarch butterflies. And, and where they congregate, where they overwinter, hundreds of millions of them actually congregate, which is absolutely, absolutely amazing. So hoping everybody's caught up to this, I'll click the uh, arrow to start the trailer. And uh, let's watch and listen. Jim, I think we've got a few folks who are um, getting a, a server error, so I think let's just check in one more time. So we pause, okay. Okay, let's see here. Oops. Looks like I see Cindy's got it now. Um, folks, just type in the chat window, let us know if you're seeing it's okay. We can also, um, I'll also put it into the chat window. You can click on that. If you are seeing the error, um, just go ahead and click on the link in the chat window. That'll also take you to the site. And then just as Jim navigates through, he'll tell you what he's doing, and you can follow along that way. OK, shall we, shall we proceed with the trailer, you think? Sure, Jim. It looks like we've got a few who are Seeing, uh, seeing the error, but go ahead and uh, proceed with the trailer. And if you are seeing the error, just click on the one in the chat window and follow along there. OK, here we go. Start it again now. Coming soon, indeed. And uh, so those scenes on the IMAX screen are just absolutely amazing. I've seen this film about a dozen times. I still get goosebumps when I see that. It's really spectacular. So you can watch that later if you had any difficulty seeing it. It's uh, right on the website, very easy to find. So we're going to look at the tabs across the top uh, to, to uh, get started. And uh, just want to take a look at um, the film. We're going to be looking at just a list of uh, theaters where it's playing. It's now playing, I think I mentioned it, about 50 plus theaters uh, worldwide. And others are opening this spring and summer. Uh, the film has been out less than a year. So IMAX theaters, since they're independently operated, tend to open the film as they, as they wish. So if you scroll down, you might find uh, a theater in your backyard or nearby. You might want to see it yourself or take your uh, students to see it. And again, there's about 50 or so listed here on the website with a few coming soon as well at the very bottom, I think. So you can uh, explore that at your leisure and see what you can, uh, if you can find the film nearby. Go back up to the tabs at the top. 
and I'm going to click on uh, Monarchs and uh, on the uh, sub tab, the butterfly. And there's there's a good bit of content here for your students or yourself just to uh, learn about the monarch. It's uh, different parts. It's migration cycle, the features of the monarch. You can see the diagram here of uh, the different parts of the of the adult monarch. And if you scroll down, you can see a uh, an image of both male and female monarchs with their distinguishing characteristics. So there's a bit of a difference between the two to be able to tell tell them apart. A little bit about their uh, senses as well. We'll go back up to the top. I'm going to click on uh, Life Cycle, which is also under the Monarchs tab. And this is something that you'll see displayed in the film in some great detail. The four stages of the Monarch, egg, caterpillar, pupa, and uh, the Monarch uh, adult listed here as butterfly. And if you scroll down, um, you'll notice that each of those stages is spelled out. And you'll see the uh, instars, the first through fifth instars, which are um, categories of the caterpillar stage where the caterpillar grows immensely over time, the pupa and the adult itself. And then finally near the bottom, something about the super generation, that, that generation of butterflies that makes the migration from northern U.S. and Canada all the way down to the uh, mountains of Mexico every year, an incredibly long journey, one of the longest known migrations on the planet. It's an amazing story. And again, more information about that in the, uh, in the film itself. Back up to uh, the Monarch tab, and we'll go down to the uh, tab that's called Epic Migration, which indeed it is. And if you scroll down to the middle of that page, I'll slow down a little bit, make sure people are catching up. There's a very colorful map on that page that shows you the uh, migration patterns. The orange arrows uh, heading south indicate the fall migration of the Monarchs down to that very uh, compact spot in central Mexico where the blue star is, where they overwinter on a couple of mountaintops. And then the green arrows indicating their spring migration north back to the northern U.S. and, uh, and Canada. Again, uh, treated in the film and in a lot of the educational materials as well. This is from Monarch Watch. You can see their logo there, an excellent organization that Grant will talk about a little bit later. And I'll show you a link to them as well in a minute. Scrolling back up to the top, we'll just look at sponsors, partners. And uh, since this has a lot to do with Mexico, you'll see a lot of Mexican firms here that were involved in helping get the film funded. But about two-thirds of the way down the page, you'll see the educational partners listed, which again includes the National Science Foundation. Thanks to their funding, this is all possible. Ourselves, the Maryland Science Center, and Grant Bowers Group Monarchs in the Classroom. And farther down, the conservation partners, the Mexican Conservation Association, and the two other organizations that do a lot of monarch research and tagging, Monarch Watch and Journey North. Uh, some wonderful websites. You'll be hearing more about those from, from Grant. And then finally, going back up to the uh, tabs again, I'm going to click on Learning Center. And over to the left on Get Involved, you'll see a few. Um, tips here on planting your own butterfly garden, which is uh, really a spectacular um, uh, activity for a class or, or even entire school. A number of teachers we've had in our workshop so far have done some of this already, and uh, it, it really is a, a wonderful event to get all your students involved in. So if you scroll down, you'll see where the best place to plant is, what to plant in the garden, milkweed seeds, very important for the monarchs, and uh, at the very bottom monarchs appearing in your garden. And then back to uh, the Learning Center tab once more. And this time I'm going to click on In the Classroom. And here you'll see uh, a set of activity guides for students and, and yourselves. Uh, these activities are pretty much drawn from uh, the University of Minnesota's Monarchs in the Classrooms activity guides. They have dozens and dozens of uh, great activities. And uh, if you've been at the workshops, you've, you've, you've uh, gotten a copy of one of those, one of these grade levels. We've extracted a few of the, the best for, for the, this page. And you can see they're available in English and Spanish and uh, set up by grade level. I'll just click on one to just show you an example, um, an activity for all age groups, it says. And this is uh, very similar to what you saw on the uh, the web page uh, earlier. 
And this is taking a bit of time to load, so we'll wait a few seconds here. I just see a note here about somebody about monarchs usually overwintering in Florida, and there are there's a subset that seems to go to Florida. Um, looks like they're taking a detour. Grant might be able to answer that better than I. He's the monarch expert, so let's see what he says when he comes on. This is still loading for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but it's uh, very slow. If it doesn't load, we'll just move on. But the one activity, again, is planting a butterfly garden, which is um, has a bit more detail that's it's laid out more like a lesson plan that you'd be familiar with. So I think maybe we'll just dispense with that in the interest of time and, and, uh, and uh, head back home if it's going to let me do that. So, Brynn, I seem to be stuck here with the little thing of trying to load the, uh, the web page. Okay. Are you ready to uh, take a few questions, Jim? Yeah, that'll be fine. We can go back to the, that home page if you can make it through that. There we go. And uh, any questions about the film, the website um, that uh, anyone has? I see there's a question about milkweed seeds. I know there's a, a company in Wisconsin that we've gotten milkweed seeds from that the, uh, we've been distributing to theaters. Um, I haven't been dealing with that directly. Again, maybe Grant uh, can answer that when he comes on. Yeah, um, I can answer that. Um, there's actually a really good website called plantmilkweed.org, um, and there are a host of um, links and resources on that web page that can tell you where to get uh, milkweed seeds from that would be um, native to your region. So that would be um, sort of the, the primary website that I would lead people to. Thanks, Grant. Um, there's a comment from Lauren about starting a butterfly garden at her elementary school, so that's great. Looks like there might be some potential there for um, pulling in some of the additional resources that Jim showed. That's great, Laura. Nice work. Well, it looks like at this point there aren't any other questions. We can definitely take some um, ones for Jim as the program progresses at some of our future stopping points. So I think we'll go ahead and move on to Grant's portion. Jim, thanks for the web tour. That's great as always. You bet. All right. Oh. OK. Um, well, my name is Grant, and I am sitting here at the University of Minnesota, and I'm looking out my window at snow falling. So I am pretty excited to talk about monarchs today, because at least it's one step closer to spring. So hopefully, talking about monarchs will make the snow go away. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about what citizen science is first before we get started um, into the different citizen science projects that there are about monarchs. Um, my definition of citizen science is just the, the participation of volunteers in research projects led by trained scientists. Um, one example of that, I think kind of a famous example, is the Christmas bird count that the Audubon group does every year. Um, this is a bird count that has been done, I think, for almost 100 years. So that's a lot of data um, over a large period of time that a single scientist would not be able to um, collect over um, on, on his or her own. So I think that's one huge advantage of citizen science is that it allows us to collect a lot of data over um, a large period of time. And then one other quick note. Um, citizen science can also sometimes be called public participation in scientific research. Um, it, the, the name citizen science can sometimes imply that you have to be a citizen to participate, and that is not the case. So um, with that, I just wanted to also mention that there are um, many different monitoring projects or uh, different citizen science projects about monarchs dedicated to monarchs. Um, and really that they are monitored in some way, shape, or form during their entire life cycle. So I'll talk about um, the spring migration and how there is a citizen science project dedicated to um, the spring migration. 
Um, then there is also a couple of different citizen science projects dedicated to um, the juveniles or the, the eggs and caterpillars and also their parasites. Um, there are also citizen science projects about um, the number of adults and the fall migration and then their arrival into the overwintering colony. And you may have heard in the news within the last um, month or two that there was, that they counted um, the amount of space that the monarchs occupy in the overwintering sites. And it's actually the lowest that's ever been recorded. And I think they've been recording that data for, um, I want to say, about 20 years. Um, so it's not great news, but having um, you know, these volunteers collecting data can help inform any decision making about monarch conservation. Um, and then along the right side here, I just have a list of different monitoring programs. I won't be covering all of those today, but I just wanted to let you know that um, there are other regional monitoring programs um, in addition to other national programs that are out there. Um, so the four that I'm talking about today um, are maybe, um, you know, that they, they exist and they are, they exist on a national level or even an international level, um, but they are certainly not the only ones. Um, so today I will be talking about the following four citizen science projects. Um, I kind of get, I think it's easy to get confused because they all have monarch in the title and they're similar, so they sound alike. Um, but I will try to, I think I've included the logos on every um, appropriate slide so that can kind of help guide your way as well. Um, so we will begin with the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, this is, I might be a little bit biased, I'm starting with the project that we run here at the University of Minnesota. Um, it has been going on since about 1997, I think was the first year that we started collecting data. Um, and there are two different ways you can participate. So anybody is welcome to participate in this. Um, you just have to have uh, a site that has milkweed um, that you have access to. So it can be, um, you know, it could be your land, it could be a garden, it could be planted milkweed, it could be milkweed that grew there naturally. Um, we're not really particular about that. When you sign up to participate, you do enter um, some information about your site. But we, you know, if you have a garden where you planted the milkweed, that is a totally appropriate place um, to participate in this project if you're interested. Um, and there are two ways to, um, to participate. You can either um, enter data in weekly or you can enter in data anecdotally sort of as you see it kind of a, as you see a monarch sort of a, a one-time occurrence. Um, the weekly um, the weekly participation of course requires more work but the, value, the, the data are far more valuable to us. Um, so once you sign up to participate and I'll show you our website in a minute um, you can see where to sign up and how that all works. Um, but once you've done that you monitor your milkweed patches daily so um, you record the number of, of milkweed plants that you look at, and then you record the number of monarch eggs and caterpillars that you see. And you report both of those numbers to our website. Um, I think that's kind of one of the cool things about our website is that you, all the data gets entered in online, and um, it actually will generate a graph for you um, on the spot in real time, which I think is pretty cool as well. Um, to date, we have about 825 sites across 36 states and three Canadian provinces, um, but we're always looking for more volunteers. Uh, a big proportion of those 800 sites, I would say almost 100 of those, maybe more, um, are actually from within Minnesota. So there's still a lot of room to grow, and I know that there were a lot of different people um, in different states across the country on that map when we were working through that tutorial. So I would love to see some more dots on our map. Um, and so from one, one thing that we do with the data um, is kind of we try to get um, a, a gauge of where the monarch population is at on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, so this is the data that we've used from volunteers participating in the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And you can see that there is a lot of fluctuation from year to year. Um, the red bar um, running horizontally is the average of those years. Um, and you can see that the, I should explain the y-axis here, um, that's peak eggs per milkweed in the upper Midwest. Um, so that means that if someone found, if they looked at 100 milkweed plants and they saw 10 monarchs, 
their density would be 0.1. So that's how we're reporting um, the number of monarchs based on its eggs per milkweed. Um, and we use eggs just because there's quite a bit of um, mortality with the eggs. So not all, not all the eggs will become caterpillars because they'll get eaten by a predator of some sort or another before they get to hatch. Um, so this is the most reliable way to measure density in the wild. So that's what's happening on the y-axis. Um, and I think it's really interesting because we would not be able to produce this data set without our volunteers. So we are very thankful for our volunteers. Um, and with that, I will take us to the website. So I will give you a couple of seconds to catch up here. Um, my web page has loaded. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is just the big um, yellow button near the bottom about um, signing up to monitor. If you click that button, um, it'll, you'll create a username and password, and then you can um, add a site. You are welcome to monitor more than one site, um, but you certainly don't have to. And it, like I said, anytime you add a new site, we ask you questions about um, kind of how big is it, roughly, what kind of milkweed do you have, um, is it in an urban setting, a rural setting, um, are there other, is there water nearby, that sort of thing. So just to, it just gives us a sense of what your site looks like. Um, once you've done that, then you can enter data. And the, the um, I want to show you how to um, do the anecdotal observation. So I'm clicking on the in the monitoring um, link on the left side of the page. I'm clicking all the way down to submit an anecdotal observation. And if you scroll down a bit, it will ask you um, for personal information and then um, kind of what you actually observed. And I think there is a lot of value in um, in this sort of data reporting, because if there, if you see a monarch, you know, in in Colorado or wherever, um, you know, we it lets us know that at that point in time there was a monarch there, and if that point that data point is not part of our data set, we can't say if there are or are not monarchs there. We just all we know is that no one reported an observation to us. So. A lack of data does not mean that there are no monarchs there. It just means that we don't know. So by, um, by submitting anecdotal observations, it actually fills in some uh, data gaps that we have. So we are definitely thankful for anecdotal observations, too. So you don't need a monitoring site to submit an anecdotal observation. This could be something as simple as, you know, I was, I was walking in the park and I saw a monarch and I want somebody to know about it. Here would be a place. Um, to submit that information. And then I'm going to scroll back up to the top here and go to the results and um, the monitoring data and graphs link. Grant, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry about that. It looks like um, we're running into some errors. Some people, again, are getting it and others aren't. Um, okay. So. I think what might work best is if we just go back to the whiteboard and then we have everyone click on the link that you put in the um, the chat there and then just okay. follow along with what you're clicking. Okay. Um, okay, so I am pasting the first link in there now. So the state list is in the, the title. Um, and so the, if you click that link, um, it gives you a map of the United States. And all of the shaded states on the map are states where we have um, people volunteering to monitor. Um, once you, I'm going to click on Minnesota, um, just because that's the data that I'm most, most familiar with. And there are actually, if you click that link, it tells you that a hun there are 180 monitoring sites in Minnesota, so I was wrong. Out of the 825 that we have, um, almost a quarter of them are from Minnesota. So we would definitely welcome volunteers um, from other states too. 
Um, once you get to the page that shows the um, red dots on the map of Minnesota, I am going to select in the Select Year drop-down menu, select 2012. And this shows you, um, if you scroll down a bit, it shows you a graph of monarch density for the year 2012. Um, and I think this is a really interesting thing about our website is that you don't have to be a volunteer to see the data or to see the results. It's available to anyone. So even if you choose not to participate in this program, um, you know, this could still be a useful resource to you. Um, just to kind of know where monarchs are or are not located or when they're in a certain place. Um, I think it's kind of a, a valuable thing to know. Um, so you can see in 2012 that um, monarchs were first reported as being in Minnesota on April 29th. Um, it is April 22nd and snow is falling on the ground, so I'm pretty sure we're going to be a little bit behind last year, but l last year was actually um, a little bit ahead of the average time monarchs returned to Minnesota. Um, so this is, you can kind of see the, the large peak in the um, earlier mid part of May, which is pretty typical. You get to see um, the greatest number of eggs right away as soon as the monarchs come back. Um, so for people living um, south of Minnesota in the, um, you know, the mid-Atlantic or the south of the kind of um, Missouri area, um, you would start to be seeing eggs here pretty quickly, I would imagine. Um, the final thing I want, there are two other things I wanted to show you um, on our website. If you click on the newsletter or just hover over the newsletter um, rectangle, there's a link to join our newsletter list. And we actually produce a monthly um, e-newsletter that we email to people just about what's happening kind of in the monarch world. So if you're interested in, in knowing more, that would be a, a good resource. And we don't, that's the only thing we send to you guys if you participate. Um, it's just one email a month. And then the last thing I wanted to show you um, is in the training section. So if you hover over the training link and click on the MLMP online training, um, this is actually a brand new thing that we've just done. It's a new um, series of videos, if you scroll down. Um, there are videos about how to be an, a volunteer with our project. So it'll tell you everything you need to know about identifying monarchs in the wild and, um, and submitting data and how to participate in the different um, kind of activities within MLMP. Um, so for those of you who were at one of our workshops and learned about the different instars of the monarch, um, you would be able to participate in this project right now. But if you were unable to attend that, you could watch these videos. And I think um, I haven't had a chance to look through all of them, but I don't think um, there are any videos that are over like four or five minutes. So it looks like there are, um, it looks like there's a lot there, but um, none of the videos are really that long. So. Um, in, in a reasonable amount of time, you could be monarch experts and you could be monarch um, volunteers for our project. So those are, the, those are sort of the key points of the website. There's a lot of information here that we won't have time to look at, but um, you know, even if you decide not to participate in the project, I would still recommend taking a look around our, our website because there are a lot of great resources. And with that, I will ask you guys a question. Um, in what ways could you imagine using the MLMP in your classroom? And while you're doing that, I'm going to um, read through the, the chat box here and see if there's anything I need to, any questions I can answer. Thanks, Grant. Good for a look at the First Citizen Science Project. This is always a good one. Um, so for folks who are interested in um, sharing this in, the, in um, your ideas how you might use this in the classroom, you can use your text box tool, which for those of you who might have joined us a little bit later after our orientation is on the screen marking toolbar that's right alongside of your participants window and the text box tool is the fourth button down. So you can just click on that and then type on the screen, as I see we've already got one and a couple people doing. So that's awesome. Great. It looks like we've got some good comments coming in.
So while you all are still typing, uh, are still typing. I am going to answer Grant. I think we lost you for a moment. Are you still there? Bryn, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, um, so I was just mentioning um, some of the, the questions in the chat that um, Carol was asking if milkweed can grow in the desert, and it can. Um, there are, there are um, a couple of species that I know of. I don't know the names off the top of my head, um, but they do exist. Um, and Virginia is asking about site criteria. Um, so we don't really have um, specific criteria about how big the site is. Um, or how many plants there are. In general, we say that if you have about 30 milkweed plants, that's a pretty good number. But if you only had 20 and still wanted to participate, you would definitely be allowed. Um, so we're not really picky about that. Really, the only criteria are that you have milkweed plants to look at and that you would have access to those um, plants. I mean, obviously, if you're on private property, we would want you to get permission to to tromp around and look at those plants before you start monitoring. But um, you know, it's it's the the site criteria. There really aren't any strict um, rules. And I am I'm looking at the the ways that you could um, incorporate this in your classrooms. And I am really excited to hear to read about all the different ways um, that you've come up with. I think um, I yeah, this is this is wonderful. So I'm glad this is useful to you all. Um, I think. For the sake of time here, we will move on to the next citizen science project. Um, and the next one I wanted to talk about is Project Monarch Health. And so this is um, based out of a lab at the University of Georgia in Athens. And it's run by a former graduate student of Karen Oberhauser, who is the professor I work for here at the University of Minnesota. Um, so. Monarch health is about a, um, a monarch parasite that um, it's a protozoan parasite called Ophriocystis electroscura. So there's kind of the word of the day. Um, and we call it OE for short. Um, and uh, this, this diagram overviews the life cycle of OE. And I will start um, at the top here next to the adult butterfly. Um, the, OE um, is, it has a spore, and so those spores are found on the abdomen of the monarch. And when a female lays an egg, um, she can sometimes accidentally scatter those spores around the monarch egg. And the first thing a monarch does when it hatches from its egg is it eats its eggshell. And so now those spores are in the monarch's gut, and that's where they reproduce. And then once the monarch pupates, um, those spores are, they reform and they're now on the surface of the resulting adult butterfly. And the cycle repeats itself. So it's, it, it, it's a parasite that doesn't kill the monarch unless it has a really high spore load. Um, but there is evidence that it can reduce the, the fitness of a population or it can result in monarchs with slightly smaller wingspans than normal or they might not be able to fly as far or fly as fast as an uninfected monarch. So there are certainly um, disadvantages to having this, this parasite, um, but it normally wouldn't kill the monarch, because if it kills the monarch, then it kills its host, and it can't um, reproduce and divide. Um, so the so Project Monarch Health is interested in um, the distribution of these spores um, across the country. And I think it's really interesting that um, the eastern migratory population has the lowest infection rate um, of any of the monarchs in North America. Um, there's a small, so that by the eastern migratory population, I mean um, the one, everything east of the Rocky Mountains except for the monarchs that are in the southern part of Florida. So these are the monarchs that are um, migrating to Mexico and are the monarchs that the film is about. Um, the western migratory population is the, are the monarchs that 
um, are west of the Rocky Mountains, and they have more of an east-west migration um, towards the coast of California. And then these monarchs up here that have the highest infection rate are um, in South Florida. And I know there was a question early on about monarchs overwintering in Florida. And there are monarchs that stay in Florida year-round. Um, whether or not they intentionally do that, we don't really know. Or if they are monarchs that um, started, if that population started out as monarchs that were on their way um, migrating to Mexico and then just kind of got lost and ended up in the southern part of Florida. We don't really know, but they do exist year-round. Um, and there is milkweed there year-round, which is kind of um, an interesting thing that at times, you know, the, the infection rate has been, you know, between 70 and 80 percent. Um, because the, the milkweed doesn't die back there, any spores that are left behind by a, an adult butterfly stay there, whereas, um, Milkweed in Minnesota and other parts of the um, range of the eastern monarchs, um, that milkweed dies back. And so the milkweed that grows in the spring every year starts out free from these parasites. Um, and so that's what we think is partly the reason for the lower infection rate. Um, to participate in this project, you can just send them an email and let them know that you're interested, and they will send you um, a free sample kit. So um, the sample kit includes um, latex gloves and then these little stickers that are clear. And it sounds kind of cruel, um, but to, to test these monarchs for OE, um, you actually take the little like, sticky label and touch both sides of the monarch's abdomen. And you can see here you get a sample of scales. And the scales are something that all monarchs have. It's what gives them their color. So they have scales um, on their abdomen and on their wings. Um, and it's within the scales that the spores are found. So you send, um, you, you would tape all the monarchs that you find in the wild. They're not interested in, in captive monarchs. So if you found a monarch in the wild, you could, you could bring a caterpillar in and rear it and then um, tape the resulting adult butterfly. Or you could go out and catch wild adult monarchs and, and test those. Um, but if you've raised a monarch from start to finish indoors, they're not interested in knowing um, if that had OE or not, because it's not really part of um, the wild population. And with that, I will take us briefly to um, the website. And since it's probably not going to work, I won't even try, but I will paste the, the link into um, the chat browser. Thanks, Grant. Yeah, I think that'll work best, and everyone can click on the link that you put in, and then um, we can just follow along with you. So there is the link. And the first thing, so it takes you to the home page. The first thing I want to do, um, is go to the um, the project monarch health and click on the project results. So co click the project monarch health link at the top um, at the top of the heading there, and then on the right side there will be a link for project results. And if you scroll down, um, this is just the the results that they've produced from their volunteers. And I think the the first graph. Um, is a line graph that you that you see if you, as you scroll down. Um, they're breaking it down, um, the infection rate down by time. So there's a data point for the early part of the year, the middle part of the year, and the late part of the year. And I think it's interesting that the, um, as the season progresses, the infection rate increases. Um, and that is perhaps due to the fact that the the spores are you know, they remain on the milkweed leaves until a monarch eats them. So um, I think it's pretty interesting. In, in, with the eastern migratory population, the infection rate is about 10%. And so even in our lab, that's kind of where, where our infection rate is at, too, is about 10%. So it's, it's pretty difficult to eliminate it completely. Um, but we, if we have, you know, somewhere between a 5 and 10% infection rate, um, we're okay with that in the wild. It's, because we raise monarchs in such close proximity to one another and in such high densities, 
um, it can, if it's left unchecked, it can get out of control really quickly. So we have to be pretty careful about that. Um, I think we're running a little behind schedule, so I'm not going to show you everything else on the website, but um, I think monarchparasites.org is a, it's a good website, and I think it's um, a relatively easy project to participate in. Um, and it's kind of a fun one, too. I think there are some elements of disease ecology, which is, is, is just something that fascinates me. So um, with that, I will we'll go back to the um, slideshow here. And I'll ask you the same question I did about MLMP. In what ways could you imagine using this citizen science project in your classroom? And while you are um, filling that out, I will go back to the chat and see if there are any questions. Again, everyone, feel free to type in your ideas for using this particular project in the classroom. You had uh, lots of great strategies for the previous one, and I see a number of ideas coming in already. If you aren't able to get your text box tool to work, don't worry about that. Just go ahead and type into the chat, and we'll see your ideas coming in there. Um, but this is great to see uh, such an active group and so many uh, cool ideas for using this with students already coming in. So there are a couple of questions. Um, one, what is the best way to catch the monarchs? And I'll be honest, I think it's pretty difficult to capture flying adult butterflies in the wild, but if you had a butterfly net, it can be done. I think if you want to participate in this project, it's much easier um, to find eggs or caterpillars raised, uh, or e find eggs or caterpillars that you found on milkweed plants and then raise them inside in individual containers. Um, I just, yeah, in eight years of being in the Monarch Lab, it's, we almost never use butterfly nets because it's just um, a pretty hard thing to do. You, you, you will find more monarch eggs and caterpillars than you will monarch adults. So to even find one is kind of a harder thing to do. And then to get it in the net um, is, not, is not easy either. So that's my recommendation is to use um, eggs and caterpillars that you find in the wild and raise them indoors. And let's see here about uh, you guys are saying some really great things about disease epidemiology and um, comparing he the health of the monarchs and comparing it to human health. Um, and I can tell you that I was actually accepted to graduate school in the School of Public Health um, just in the last month. And I actually talked about, in my personal statement, I talked about um, OE and monarchs and how I see parallels between that and human health and like influenza. Um, and it sounded sort of like a strange comparison to make, but apparently it worked because they let me in. So um, that was kind of exciting. But yeah, there are certainly comparisons that you can make um, between human health and monarch health. So I think that's kind of a, a really cool thing. And for health class, of course that would be a good idea. I hadn't even thought about that, but that's a really good one too. Um, so I think we will move on to the third project, which is Journey North. Um, Journey North is, I think, based out of um, somewhere in New, in New England, I believe. Um, and they do more than just monarchs, but they, they um, kind of follow different migrations. So monarchs, birds, I think they even do whale migrations. Um, but so the monarchs are just one thing that they do, where the previous two projects we discussed were monarch specific. Um, one of the things that they do is they track the spring migration of the monarchs north. Um, so we'll go to the website. Or I'll show you the link to the website in a minute. Um, but you can do, um, by per you, it's really easy to participate in this project. You just um, record and submit the date that you first saw a monarch in your area, and then you end up as a dot on their on their map down here. So this particular map I just is just a screenshot of their website, and um, it's winter sighting. So the red triangles are where monarchs were sighted in the winter. 
Um, and then they do the same thing with milkweed. So you can, uh, this was not a good screenshot to grab here, but um, you can record the or submit the date that you saw um, the first milkweed plant. And in Minnesota, I know that is at least a couple weeks away. Um, and it's interesting, if you compare the two maps, the, the milkweed will always appear first um, in a given area. So the, the monarchs are following the milkweed germination north because that is their only host plant. So they need that to lay their eggs on. And I think that's just a really interesting, um, these, I think these maps are a really interesting way of um, displaying that type of information or that type of data. Um, and this is a, 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 ma a map of the some of the, the some of the ways that the data have been analyzed from this project. It's the order of state by state occupation in the spring. Um, so Texas, not surprisingly, is the first state to see monarchs in the spring. Um, given that they're coming, you know, out of Mexico, they really don't have a choice but to go to Texas. Um, but what I think is interesting is that the second state is actually not a state that touches Texas. It's Florida um, and then Louisiana. And I think there are some interesting um, variables at play here. What I think is probably happening is that monarchs are being spotted in Florida first because there are more people, um, more people living in Florida or more people in tune with monarchs in Florida. Um, and probably because the monarchs are traveling along the coast here. So if they're traveling right along the coast, there isn't really, um, you know, a lot of opportunities for monarchs to be seen in Louisiana because obviously they have to go over Louisiana to get to Florida. Um, and the same is true of some other states in here as well. Um, I could look at this, this, this map all day long. I think it's really fascinating. Um, so you can kind of see how they how they expand um, east and north at the same time. Um, I will point out that Kentucky and Minnesota have the same number, so that means that they were um, the first monarch was spotted um, within the same week. Um, but obviously, monarchs are going to be in Kentucky before they're clear up in Minnesota. Um, so I think that's another case of the the number of people looking for. Um, monarchs in a given state. So there's kind of some interesting um, like population data collection sort of um, issues at play here as well, which I think is kind of an interesting thing to talk about, especially if you're um, working with a group of high school students about um, de designing um, data collection methods. So um, that's kind of my little bit of information about this, about this map, but I think it's a pretty fascinating thing. Um, and then they, so in addition to the spring migrations and the spring germination of milkweed, they also do fall migrations. Um, so we don't know very much about this. Um, but as monarchs are uh, traveling south back to Mexico, um, they roost overnight in trees or even in shrubs. And it's a pretty, I have actually never seen this happen. Um, so if you do see this, consider yourself lucky. There are some people who, um, for one night a year in their backyard, they'll have a tree full of monarchs that, you know, in the morning, those monarchs will scatter and they'll be gone. But the next year, there are more monarchs there. And then there are other people who it's a one-shot deal where they only, you know, one year, six years ago or however long ago, they saw monarchs in, their, in, in a tree, but they haven't been back since. And we don't understand why they roost or how they roost or how they come to the same tree year after year or why they come to the same tree year after year and sometimes they don't. Um, so this is one way of kind of getting that information about what is happening in the fall. Um, so I highly recommend you participate in this project if you see a fall roost to report that to the website so there is a record of it. And these are um, just some examples of monarchs in different um, roosting situations where the, the the trees that they roost in in Mexico in the overwintering sites, it's one type of tree. Um, I'm not a tree person, but I can tell you that these are not all the same tree. That looks like a palm tree of some sort. Um, so they, they aren't nearly as picky about where they roost when they're um, on their way to Mexico.
And with that, I will go to, I will take you to the website, but I'm not going to go to that website. I'm going to take you directly to the link um, with the map, if you'll just bear with me for a second. I will copy and paste it into the chat log. Um, so there's the first link. And if you give that a second to load, um, Well, it's supposed to be animated, but is it working for you guys? It's, it is animating for me. It just took, it took a second. So this is the link for this year's spring migration. Um, and if you give it a second here, it kind of reloads and will start over. Um, it looks like currently monarchs are um, about as far north as um, Missouri or um, Virginia and even into um, North Carolina. So they're still making their way north. Um, one of the, a common question I get is, when will I see monarchs in my state? And um, I always refer people to this website because this is um, they have the, the past maps from previous years, and they also have the current year. So you so if they're not in your state yet, you can kind of look at those past maps and get an idea of um, roughly when they will be there. And I will paste the link to. Um, the 2012 map as well. So that is the second link that I posted in the chat log. Um, if you go to learner.org, um, you can see the other types of migrations that they track, and then you can also see the um, the milkweed maps as well. So those are sort of the, the key points that I wanted to point out about this, um, about this citizen science project. I do think that this is probably the easiest one to participate in, and there are a lot of opportunities to include um, geography lessons in here as well. So with that, I will pose a question to you all about how you could see yourselves using this citizen science project in your classroom. And while you guys are typing, I will look to see if there are any questions in the chat log. And everyone, your text box tool is now available on your screen marking toolbar. So feel free to type on screen, or again, if you are having any kind of trouble with the um, screen marking toolbars, feel free to type in the chat. And I know we'll get some good ideas. You guys have been a great group tonight and have lots of ideas for how you might use this with students. So it's great to see some good ones already coming in. So there's a question about um, about is Cuba involved in the migration, and that is actually a really good question. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think that um, that the monarchs that migrate to Mexico, I don't think that um, Cuba is involved in that. Um, and I actually it would take me a little bit of digging. I'm not I can't recall if there are even monarchs in Cuba. Um, so it looks like you've asked a question that I don't have an answer to, which is not uncommon. Um, I would, yeah, I, I, I don't know if they, I, I'm quite certain that they're, that Cuba is not involved in the migration, um, but I'm less certain if Cuba has monarchs or not. Yeah, and it looks like you guys are coming up, coming up with some good ideas here about data analysis and tracking um, or taking averages of when monarchs are seen in a certain area. I think those are all um, good ideas, and I think um, you know, as somebody who really likes maps and who really likes the way data can be visualized, I think these maps um, are really wonderful. Um, it looks like you all are done typing, so I am going to move on to the fourth and final project here. 
um, and that is Monarch Watch. Monarch Watch is based out of the University of Kansas, um, and this is the project that does the Monarch tagging. So I have found that um, if people are familiar with um, any of these projects, it's this one. Um, and it's a pretty important one is because the, um, the tags that um, Fred Urquhart used um, to discover where the um, monarchs were in the discover where monarchs went um, in Mexico, they, th those, that, that discovery would not have been possible without tags um, such as this one. Um, the, the tags that we use today are a little bit different than the ones that Fred Urquhart was using in the 70s. His tags actually folded over um, the edge of the wing like this. Um, and I believe that this, the adhesive used to the, the adhesive used for these tags um, was like designed specifically with the monarch's wing in mind. So they're designed to adhere to a monarch's wing, which I think is pretty cool. Um, to participate in this project, you actually purchase the tags from Monarch Watch. Um, I think they're available for purchase anytime, but they won't actually ship them to you until um, it's about until they're until you're ready to use them. You only tag monarchs that um, will migrate south. So if you ordered um, tags in January, you probably wouldn't get them until um, the end of summer or early fall, depending on where you live. Um, but one cool thing that they've been able to do with this data. Um, is the is is this graph here? I think is a one way they've analyzed the data. I think it's interesting um, to know the number of monarchs that need to be tagged for recovery in a given area. Um, so, for example, in the southern part of Texas, um, it the rate of recovery is about one in thirty-four, and this is recovery in Mexico in the overwintering sites. Um, so, I think as you go north, it, it's I, it's a little interesting that if you look at um, the northern part of Minnesota, the recovery rate is much lower, so only one out of 205. Um, but this number here, this 351 in the southern part of or the northern part of Louisiana into Arkansas, is a little interesting to me why that number is so high, and it could just be a really low sample size. Maybe they haven't had a lot of people participating in the project in that region. Um, so it kind of goes back to the map that we saw for Journey North um, of the, the the order of occupation for each state. There could be a similar thing happening there where there just aren't as many people releasing tagged monarchs in that spot. So I think this is a pretty interesting map. Um, the general um, pattern here is that it seems like the more north you go, the, the less likely the monarch is to be recovered, which kind of makes sense because they have farther to migrate. Um, I'm actually not going to visit the, the Monarch Watch site. Um, the only thing I would show you is where to purchase them, and they just have a, there's a store link where you can buy the tags. I think um, they sell many different quantities. I think the, the, I think you have to buy at least 25 is the um, minimum number you can order. And you do have to buy new tags um, every year. You can't reuse tags. It kind of goofs up their, um, their data collection system. So there's a unique number on each of those tags. And then um, when when you order tags and when they ship those tags, you get a data sheet that accompanies it. And you just um, enter, you write down the, the date, whether it's a male or female, um, and then where you're recovering it from. And then um, you, you, you turn in that data sheet back to Monarch Watch so they know um, if you did, if your monarch is recovered, they know where it came from. Um, and I think um, it's just a fun thing to participate in. I think the, I can't remember the rate of recovery, um, but the overall percentage is not high. So if you do do this with your, with your students or with your, um, with a class, um, you know, don't get them too excited because the odds of their monarch getting, getting found is not great, but it has happened. So um, it kind of reminds me of um, get the message in a bottle where you kind of, let the message in a bottle go down the river and see if anybody recovers it. We actually did that in fifth grade, which is a little surprising to me because it's basically littering. But um, I think this project is kind of a an interesting take on um, 
that on, on their migration. And without these monarch tanks, we would perhaps not have discovered where the monarchs go um, in the winter. So with that, I will ask you, um, which of these citizen science projects you learned about here would you be most likely to use in your classroom? And while you are um, answering that, I'm going to read through the chat and answer any questions. Or if you have any questions, any other questions, you could chat those or you could um, type those in the chat log as well. Okay, everybody, our poll button is open, and we're looking forward to seeing your responses on this one. Having a uh, a look at what you think might be the most useful or pertinent to your students in your classroom. So feel free to select from that poll button, which is located at the top of the participant window right under your own name. And if you uh, want to explain any further, you can feel free to type in the chat. Also, as Grant mentioned, if you have any final questions, go ahead and type those in now before we wrap up. Um, we were. It was a great um, opportunity to interact with you all on this presentation. And it sounds like you all had awesome ideas. So we're looking forward to um, seeing what you think about these as well. I'll give just another moment for folks to uh, submit an answer on our poll before we publish those up so we can kind of look and see what everyone's thinking here, about which ones they might want to use. It looks like. We've got uh, most everyone in there, so I'll go ahead and put that up. And it looks like a lot of people are thinking about using multiple projects, which is awesome. And some have a few favorites, so great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I see a question there from Cynthia about uh, checking out the archive. And yes, it will be um, posted on our website in the NFT Learning Center, so you can um, access it there. I'll put the link or the archive will be posted later this evening into the chat window. And we'll also be sending everyone an email um, tomorrow that has this link as well. So you'll get a reminder about that. So Kathleen mentioned um, that she uses the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that they have they have a host of different citizen science projects about birds. Um, and you know, in addition to monarchs, there are a lot of different other organisms that there are um, that that have citizen science projects studying them. Um, so this was, you know, we presented these monarch projects as a way to um, incorporate monarchs into your classroom either before or after or maybe both. Um, you know, in coordination with the, the Flight of the Butterflies film. Um, and for those of you who have been to one of the um, symposia at an NSTA conference, um, this gives you a bit more information to work with and um, a bit more knowledge to hopefully include in your classroom and share with your students. Um, and if you haven't had the opportunity to attend one of those symposiums, I would recommend um, checking out, there are just a huge number of monarch resources out there. Um, but I will include the link in the chat log to our our lab's website, which is just monarchlab.org. Um, and here is the link to the home page. Um, in the, the, that takes you to the, the home page, and there are kind of four different sections to the website um, where the, the monarch lab the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project is one of them, is one of those sections. Um, and then the Monarch Lab section is the place you would go to learn about how to raise monarchs in your classroom, um, which really gives you a lot of information about um, you know, having the right cage and having the right milkweed and having enough milkweed is kind of the big one. Um, and really the tips and tricks to be successful at it in your classroom. So um, the, my, web, my email address is posted there on the final slide. Um, as is our web address again, in case you need it. Um, but I just wanted to um, thank you for listening and thank you for participating. And um, I apologize for my voice. I'm still kind of recovering from a cold. But um, I made it. And um, if there are any final questions, I would be happy to take them now. Thanks, Grant. And I'll mention also to um, 
to Cynthia, who came on a little bit um, later and was interested in the archive, that we will be repeating this program one week from today on April 29th. So if anyone um, did you know, miss a portion of it, we welcome you to come back on with us next Monday. Also, you can share with any colleagues that might be interested in hearing directly from Grant. Um, you can um, register for the April 29th se session by going to the link that I posted um, just a minute ago in the chat. I'll put it again there. So if you do have colleagues who are interested in Monarch Butterfly Citizen Science projects, do encourage them to join us for that. Um, you can, of course, always watch the archive as well. But if you want to hear from your colleagues and hear directly from Grant and for Jim, um, come on with us next week. And Cynthia, yes, it will be the same time, uh, 6.30 to 8 o'clock Eastern time. Um, so I think with that, we'll go ahead and um, wrap up, wrap things up this evening. I did want to um, give our great thanks to tonight's presenters, Jim O'Leary for from the Maryland Science Center, and Grant from Monarchs in the Classroom at the University of Minnesota. It was a fantastic presentation tonight, and um, so many awesome resources for the classroom. So everyone, let's use our emoticon button. That's the one with the face on it. And scroll down and pick the applause icon to give our presenters a round of applause. Thank you, everyone. And we would like to thank the sponsors of today's web seminar, the Maryland Science Center, Monarchs in the Classroom at the University of Minnesota, and NSF, the Nas National Science Foundation. We'd also like to thank the administration of NSCA for their support for web seminars. And here's a look at our upcoming web seminar calendar. You can join us tomorrow, April 23rd, to learn more about the Learning Center and taking advantage of the free resources. You can also join us later on the evening of the 23rd to um, check out one of our programs in the NASA Explorer School Series, Center of Mass and Center of Pressure, Engineering a Stable Rocket. And then on Wednesday, April 24th, another in our NASA Explorer School Series, Human Body Space Adaptations. And you can register for these programs, including the repeat of tonight's presentation on April 29th, by going to learningcenter.nsta.org slash web seminars. Thank you, everyone, again, for your participation today, and we look forward to seeing you again on another program. <laughs>